Welcome to the Human Experience Podcast, the only podcast designed to fuse your left and right brain hemispheres and feed it the most entertaining and mentally engaging topics on the planet. As we approach our ascent, please make sure your frontal, temporal and occipital lobes are in their full upright position. As you take your seat of consciousness, relax your senses and allow us to take you on a journey. We are the Intimate Strangers. Thank you for listening. What's up, guys? This is our interview with Mr. Dick Sutphin. He has had quite a long standing career and he's been doing this since the 1970s or so. And him and his wife, Roberta, are two of the sweetest people I've ever encountered. Just really open, kind, warm hearted people. And I've been listening to his tapes for so long, so I just wanted to bring him on and see what his perspective was. It really is interesting when you dig into how many hypnosis sessions Mr. Sutphin has done. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this conversation. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check us out on Twitter at TheHumanXP and also give our Facebook page a like. And thank you so much for listening. The human experience is putting you into a deep hypnotic trance as we speak to my guest, Mr. Dick Sutphin. He is the author of Million Copy Bestseller, You Were Born to Be Together. He is the founder of Valley Sun Publishing. He has created over 300 mind programming CDs and over 190,000 people have attended his seminars. Richard, that is quite the resume, sir. Welcome to HXP. (laughs) Thank you very much, Xavier. Thank you for having me. Oh, yeah, it's a pleasure. So I kind of laid the foundation of who you are here a bit in the intro, but for the people that don't know, could you just give us your background, please? Okay, well, I started out uh, in the advertising field working with um, major uh, advertising agencies around the country, and it was art director's work. and I started writing with the uh, copywriters and as a result I wrote about what I was experiencing in just my hobby work, uh, metaphysics, uh, hypnosis, things along that line and it became uh, quite popular. I eventually started to do some hypnosis work. I studied uh, to be a hypnotist and started uh, hypnotizing clients, hypnotizing anybody that was willing to sit still for it. (laughs) And and that was very effective and uh, I started experimenting with techniques that uh, could take it what seemed to me a lot further than than people were taking it. I got into it because I was interested in the metaphysical side. Mm -hmm. I wasn't really interested in being a hypnotherapist. And yet, you know, I was challenged by it, the fact that you could uh, use the techniques to effectively heal people, resolve problems, uh, find the cause of the problems in their life. If the problems went back, to other lifetimes, and uh, usually they did. So I kept experimenting with it, and uh, I started writing books. And Simon and Schuster was my major publisher, and uh, I wrote about uh, I think seven, eight of them for Simon and Schuster, and for other publishers along the way. And uh, <laughs> that's basically. Um, that's basically it, Xavier. <laughs> that's that's quite the career. So I mean, so how how many hypnosis sessions do you think that you've done total? Let's give or take. Oh boy, the hypnosis sessions are oh, thousands. I I couldn't even begin to tell you because so many of of the sessions that I've done have been in seminars. They have been to demonstrate techniques in seminars, but I would say several 
oh, five, six, seven, eight thousand at least uh, sessions where a client has sat down with me in um, in whatever room I was or office I was uh, doing hypnosis in at the time, mm -hmm. and uh, has gone on a journey. So, hmm, interesting. So, so what? I mean, what ex exactly is happening when? you are putting someone into a state of trance or hypnosis? Well, it's easy to put someone into a state of hypnosis. Um, I use mind electronics techniques uh, probably as much as anybody does because I invented the techniques that are so effective. But that'll be a matter of a sound. Uh, and the sound will be played in the background, in the office, and I will then speak them, talk them down into a, an altered state of consciousness. And I like to work in a theta level, so I'm bringing them down into theta, which is the state at which they are most likely to uh, see visions. It's the state of consciousness. It's called the hypnagogic state. And it's where uh, Einstein used to go every afternoon after lunch. Uh, he laid down to take a nap, which really wasn't a nap, to alter his consciousness. And uh, then he'd come up and uh, he would come up with all these ideas. And so when Einstein talked about doing that, he was going into hypnosis and he was channeling his awareness, his ideas, his discoveries. Yeah, yeah, it's, that's that's incredibly intriguing. So you mentioned a metaphysic aspect of the hypnosis. What I mean, what was the most remarkable thing that you found that these people were experiencing? Okay, well, I well, that's the primary reason. I went into it in the first place was to explore past lives. The concept of being born in a, you know, a series of reincarnations and uh, the fact that these past lives would be affecting the present life. And if uh, someone had a particular hang up or problem or uh, something they were dealing with, that they couldn't explain uh, in a context of their normal life, why I would take them back to the cause, and this initially was really all I was doing with it. It was all I cared about doing with the work. But uh, they would go back to the cause, and I oftentimes would not uh, tell them to go back into a past life. I would say, let's go back to the cause, wherever it may be. Mm -hmm. And they would go back to another time, another place, and more often than not, they would go back to another life. So when they started to describe um, lifetimes, I mean, the moment they'd start talking about their experiences, it would be very obvious that they were not talking in the context of this life just lapsed into Dutch and just went on with Dutch. And I have always a tape recorder right beside. Dutch uh, is a hard language. To it's a hard in. language. And ancient Dutch is a lot harder language. Wow. And uh, so I recorded it and asked her if I could give it to someone who might know. And this was the... Uh, head of language at Arizona State University. So I took it down there and um, I had him look at, listen to it. And he said, oh my God, that is Dutch. But he said, where did you ever find old Dutch like this? Who could still speak like this? <laughs> I told I explained to him that it was coming from a young woman who was hypnotized and he was, you know, that was out of his realm. He really, I don't think, was too much interested in that, but uh, a lot of people were. And so it was the beginning of uh, checking out 
to see if the situations being discussed, if another language was used, and I oftentimes asked them, could you speak up and speak in the uh, language of your day uh, back in 1714 in, uh, in the Netherlands? And mm-hmm. I'd say about half the time, people just easily would go right into the other language, the ancient language that they were, they were speaking in. Hmm. So, and this proved not to be anything very unusual at all. Most hypnotists I found who were used to doing a lot more work than I had done at the beginning, um, they'd all experimented with this sort of thing, and so they all had experiences along this line. Well, I've I've personally listened to your tapes and switching gears a little bit here, but I love your stuff. I mean, I I use uh, there's there's a few th- few ones that I specifically that I use. There's a there's <laughs> a like a confidence zapper which I use, which is great, yeah. and there's a few others that I use every day. But let's let's rewind a little bit. Well, thank you for doing that. I want to insert thank you. They're they're amazing to listen to. So. Let's go back to advertising because you you discuss these these other areas and I mean in your talk the battle for your mind you talk about yeah. brainwashing and hypnotic t- techniques being used by religions and so and how does this process happen and and how can we be aware you had a career in advertising so well it's not very difficult to hypnotize someone, Xavier, all you would have to do in a simple form would be to create a quiet environment. Churches are being built today because they know the power of the meditative state. Often churches will use meditation as part of their service. So if you put somebody with a low lighting Envi- put them in a low lighting environment and you pay, play music where there is no tension or no resolve such as uh, oriental music why you create an environment in which if you just speak in a paced voice about like this mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. will put someone into a deep hypnotic Sleep. Sleep. Hmm. And uh, (laughs) so you can do this very easy, uh, even without somebody realizing it's what's going on. I can smooth my voice out and strike just about any speed. And I'll usually bring it down to about 45 beats a minute. And if I used pacing and I'm in a quiet environment, and even if I'm not in a real quiet environment, I can usually hypnotize just about anyone if I've set out to do that. But if you were working on your computer, I'm a writer, I write books, and so if I'm spending all day writing without being interrupted very often, I am going into a theta level of consciousness simply as part of the environment. It's all it takes. But there are so many situations which are conducive to an altered state. I used to be a runner, and I'd go out every morning. I'd put on my running shoes, and uh, I would put in at least two, three miles, oftentimes, oh, maybe five, six miles. Well, after you reach about the first uh, about the first mile, you just lapse into a state where you're running, but you don't even realize that there's no pain. You're just flying, right. and and at that point, you are in a deep his state of hypnosis. And so when it when it first started to happen. I remember uh, writing some articles for some of the running magazines, and I would talk with the writers who were uh, doing it much more seriously than I. And I'd say, well, what is, is there anything that um, 
that you find common to all runners? And the answer was, yeah, Richard, the, um, primarily the runners are the most mellow people on the planet. And, of course, anybody that spends a lot of time at a theta level, um, if they do this twice a day, uh, they probably are not going to come back into a full waking state of consciousness. And so you're, you're putting people, they are putting themselves into hypnosis. So many of the runners at the time would be running along and then they would say, oh my God, I'm floating above myself watching myself run down the street. And they simply had left their bodies because they had lapsed into probably uh, the theta level for sure. And at that point, it was very easy for them to be running down the street and watching themselves from above. Would you say, would you say that most people are susceptible to these types of techniques? I would say yes, absolutely. Watching television, I believe it was Thomas Mulholland was a doctor back in uh, Boston. And he did a lot of uh, experimental work with how long, young children, how long, if they turned on the TV, how long would it take them to be able to go into hypnosis? And sometimes it was as, as short a period as 10 seconds, especially when you take a look then over the years at the way advertising agencies have used uh, hypnotic techniques to deepen the state when people are watching. So if we can if we can zoom out a bit and kind of cover the other aspects of your work because I mean your tapes cover a lot of things and you've written a lot of different books on like soul agreements and like assertiveness and how to become more assertive and how to instantly read people but this idea of soul agreements I mean how did you move into this sort of line of thought that we maybe have agreements with other people and we're karmically connected. How did you get into that? Well, really, that goes back to my first book, You're Born Again to Be Together, uh, primarily, Xavier. The idea that uh, we come together with other people, um, it's by plan. Um, people who've been together before say many times they're going to come back and they're going to be together again. And so there are often times, and I mean often, that the an individual will be born into the same family that they lived in before. So in other words, you might be your own grandpa. And so I have a lot of little cases I will use to describe this. Was there, I mean, if you, if we zoom out some more, was there something that you would attribute as the source of all of this? Were you able to ever find a, so, I mean, when, when you talk about this, I picture a sort of lattice of interconnected sort of threads or like a source of all things. I mean, were you able to get to that point? Was there, was there any, anything that you found that kind of blew your mind? <laughs> my mind is constantly, <laughs> continues to be blown. And my wife does too. <laughs> I would say that over the years, and there's been quite a few years now, it's spirit. And the inner involvement of spirit with our life. And when you are looking for how spirit, and when I say that, I'm really talking about God. Uh, the idea God is more and more and more real to me, and God would interact with us in ways that I just can't deny. And so I see an awful lot of the magical things that I didn't use. I, I was raised Presbyterian, but uh, I didn't take it very seriously. Uh, over the years, though, uh, as I got older... I continued to read, I continued to study, and then called upon God's help uh, several times. And sometimes where 
there was an answer, a uh, very quick answer, and I just, uh, there's no way to deny it. So that would be the glue that held it all together, that we are souls who are here to learn. We're going to learn as fast or as slow as we decide to do it. We are going to learn. We're going to perfect our soul. And I can't, you know, I'm number one, I can't tell you what that's going to mean uh, <laughs> if I do that. That but, was my uh, next question, actually. <laughs> yeah. But I have studied with so many great people uh, just as part of doing my work. In your book, uh, Earthly Purpose, uh, your research led to a discovery that the 25,000 residents of this Mexican city all agreed to reincarnate together every 700 years or so for an important purpose. And what that, was... sounds, <laughs> that sounds just so bizarre. I, I know that. But uh, yes, that's what that was a... I decided that when I wrote that book, I was going to have to write it um, with whatever came up. And then some things came up I didn't like. Um, the people of uh, Teotihuacan had the help of extraterrestrials. Well, that, you know, I don't, you know, I know extraterrestrials are real. People like Brad Stryger and other uh, researchers are good friends of mine. Um, and I've talked to them for years, and boy, they've convinced me. But I don't write about ETs and uh, that sort of thing. And yet I said, well, if that's what comes up, I'm going to have to write about it. And then I had to swallow my words because on that book in particular, everybody, and I had hundreds of participants in that book, and they saw or were involved with the extraterrestrials who helped to bring that civilization together when they needed to, and so on. What, what purpose were they, and what was the purpose of their bringing together these people? I would imagine, as best I can remember now, it's been a while since I wrote that one, but uh, it was in regard to the technology. That's where the extraterrestrials seem to step in when we are in need of help. Um, I have taken so many people back to the uh, Atlantis lifetime. I think most people alive today were alive in Atlantis at one time or another. Edgar Cayce said Atlantis lasted for a hundred thousand years. So that's, uh, that's quite a span of history. I doubt that it was a very advanced uh, civilization for all 100,000 years, but uh, there was great uh, ET involvement. Uh, everything from carving the great pyramid that they used as a source, a power source, out of a mountain, and um, they developed a very advanced uh, society in many ways like ours today and a lot of our bad stuff today. So Richard, so, why why do you think our memories are erased when we reincarnate? I mean, wouldn't it be more advantageous if we remembered these past lives? Well, I don't know, uh, Xavier. It seems to me it's hard sometimes for people to deal with one past life. Uh, if you had to deal with hundreds or thousands of past lives, uh, I think uh, our egos could really get in the way, especially if you started finding out that you were somebody who wielded a lot of power or was great at a particular uh, talent or something. And to try to deal with one lifetime, people have a hard time doing that. Uh, now you have to deal with the complications of many lifetimes and maybe many people who were um, enemies in your past lives or people that really helped you 
it would become a logistical, in my mind, just an, a logistical impossibility, it would seem. Um, and so it's not that they're hidden, but you're going to have to work on it uh, to find them. But a past life regression, I mean, I don't think I've ever had anyone that I couldn't easily, if they were interested in the subject, I couldn't easily slide them in to in a state of hypnosis or sometimes uh, with the suggestion that they dream of a past life. And when they come into my office again next week, I could access that dream with hypnosis. But it's very easy to pick up the, the most important aspects. So oftentimes I will send somebody back. I, I'm hypnotizing them back into maybe the, the lifetime that uh, is most affecting their current life. More, more often than not, that's what I'll, I'll instruct them to do. So I'm asking them to go back to a time um, in the one life, memories of the one life that's most affecting their current life. And wherever they, um, they land, so to speak, why I will start moving them um, around in time until we're located, we're moving into a, uh, a situation where they are recalling something that seems to be important to them that they're coming in at this time. Uh, maybe they are trying to find out why they've always had headaches. Well, this is a case, the Edie Fiore case. Edie Fiore and I are friends and we uh, worked together in the early stages of our careers. But um, this woman came to Edie and she had uh, horrible uh, headaches and she had no reason for them. But every week she'd come down where she was just incapacitated because of these awful migraine type of headaches. Edie took her back to the cause, and she found herself, as a young girl, about seven years of age, one day, the parents had said, well, watch your sister, and it just infuriated the precocious seven-year-old who picked up a rock and slammed it down on the top of her little sister's head and killed her. And so, you know, at that point, her father almost killed her. And um, so these are trauma type events that you're you're going back to essentially, and you're you're healing these traumas. Yes, you go back to them. You forgive yourself. Uh, you forgive other people who are involved. You really, it's more important that they go through um, the experience, and so they understand it. It's not sub- something negative that's under the surface just bubbling and boiling uh, like that, where she felt so guilty that she'd killed her sister. So she grew up, and at the age of about seven, in the current life, she started having these headaches on a weekly basis. So you'll find this in every aspect of life. I Oftentimes when I'm teaching uh, students to be hypnotists, I will go through a bunch of lifetimes that I can cover in about five to eight minutes. I'll talk about a man, uh, a true case that came to me, and he was, he said, you know, is there anything you can do to help me? I need to make more money, and I should be making more money, but every time I'm offered an advancement in my career, I I just panic. I, I start to sweat. And I can focus upon nothing else. So I finally say no just to keep myself from going crazy. And so I send him back to the cause to look at why he had an aversion to 
taking on more responsibility in his life. He saw himself as the captain of an old wooden sailing ship, and one night it caught fire. The captain should have been the last guy off the ship, but instead of uh, arousing the men, making sure everyone got off the ship, he just ran and lowered one of the lifeboats and rowed away. And he was a complete coward in uh, the way he dealt with it. The result of that, some of the men survived. He survived. They returned to the little town in England where they'd all come from. And, uh, I mean, he was disgraced. He would never be given another uh, uh, skipper position on a sailing ship. And so he had lived probably several lifetimes in between, unwilling to take on more responsibility. A full lifetime. I mean, you're, you're expressing an entire lifetime trying to let go of this major experience. I mean, that, that blows me away. So, I mean, you, you have another one of my kind of favorite tapes that, that you've made is your wealth and success zapper. And you call them zappers, but... They're yes. supposed to zap you into this sort of, and they're very suggestive and they, they kind of just repeat these phrases, but I mean, what led you to do the wealth and success one? <laughs> For something like wealth and success, I would have been doing um, a tape that would uh, round out the line or a CD these days or an MP3. But uh, so it would be in there to round out the line and I would uh, bring out and I've uh, I know you said 300 uh, titles that I've created. Actually, it's closer to 900 (laughs) as my my wife has been finding out because uh, oftentimes I would just if I had something and I could replace it or bring bring out a variation that I thought could be more effective why I did and uh, so that I've just done so many over the years Xavier um, so the wealth and success tape would be like uh, most of the tapes that are the uh, CDs or the mp3s that I would create I would just gather I usually start with about 13 suggestions. So I would come up with the 13 suggestions that I felt might be most effective. And this would be one sentence long. And uh, so with that, why we'll string together uh, several techniques and the suggestions repeated over and over many times. And... uh, String them. If it was a zapper, why, uh, <laughs> that's 74 minutes of listening to me give you suggestions. And uh, so if you listen to that very often, it's, it's going to sink in and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be effective. What was the message? I mean, what was the, I mean, after, after everything that you've seen and all the past life regressions that you've done and the, the meta, metaphysical aspect of it and these alien sort of encounters, I mean, what, for <laughs> you, what has been the most, I guess, the most strong thing that you have felt towards what our purpose is here and what we're doing here on the planet? Yeah. All right. Well, I think we have a lot of spiritual messages and uh, uh, lessons that we should pick up along the way and we can apply the messages, um, a message such as it is your resistance to what is that causes your suffering. Well, that message is so powerful. Um, It's just so incredible. Your resistance to what is that causes your suffering. Well, now that's Buddha. And uh, when he's talking about your resistance to what is, he's talking about all the things in life that you resist. And that's what's causing our suffering. 
We alone cause our own success and our own suffering. And I know this uh, as well as I know anything. Mm -hmm. And I know that I'm going to be writing about this on a different level and about the state of mind and about our resistance. And I've said things like this, not as eloquent as, um, as Buddha said them, but I mean, that one to me just knocks my socks off because we all resist so much in life. And as a result, the resistance is always fear. It's always what, what causes the suffering that we experience in our life. We are here and uh, we should be experiencing lives of uh, blessed freedom and uh, joy. And all too often, we are, we are creating lives very different uh, as we go along the path. Right. So I know that that's what I'm going to have to write about. And I'm going to have to try to figure a way to bring people into a state of consciousness at which they can um, suggest or, or listen to a tape like uh, you just described or a uh, MP3, and it'll be a hundred times more effective because of the state, the level uh, of mind that they, um, that they are in at the time they request it. And I don't, I, don't, I don't mean to be abstract or weird on this, uh, and that's probably the best way I can describe it right now. I'm very excited about it. Fair enough. And I will, enough. I will send you one, okay? <laughs> I guarantee <laughs> That sounds good to me. You know, I was going to move towards ending the conversation. We, we do have about eight minutes here. But have you ever, have you ever had, I mean, if, if we're talking about going into the past and our past lives, but have you ever tried going into the future and our future lives? Yes. Yes. And what, was the, what was the result of that? Well, the result was, um, you know, if somebody is willing to want to do this, um, you can do it. You can go forward. I mean, it's a psychic. You could go to a good psychic today, and the psychic might be able to tell you a lot about your life to come. You can go. You don't need a psychic. You can go into uh, a hypnotic state and progress forward in time, and uh, you can see all this for yourself. I've got here at uh, the company, I've got a, uh, an MP3 or a CD called uh, It's a Hypnosis Session in which it's a future progression. And I have gone in always for a reason. Uh, I had a woman who was just almost hysterical because she couldn't um, figure out who she wanted to be with, her husband or her lover. And, you know, that sounds silly, but, <laughs> you know, to, to her, that was the biggest question. She couldn't, uh, until she got that solved, she figured she just couldn't go on. And so that's what she was looking for. And uh, I thought, damn, well, I'm going to, have to do something. So I moved her forward um, to the lifetime, her future lifetime, the next lifetime. And I then regressed her back from the future life into this one. And I said, what did you do? Did you marry your uh, lover or did you stay with your husband? And she said, I, I stayed with my husband. But now in this life, I could be with my lover. And so she was leading, she was seeing, and who knows what she was really seeing, but she was satisfied by the experience of, of being able to see herself in a future life married to the man that uh, was her lover in this life. <laughs> and if hmm. that's not a convoluted <laughs> yeah. 
subject to hand on. <laughs> <laughs> right. What is, but uh, it's it's very, uh, the work is very interesting. It, de- it never quits. Uh, w- my wife and I are just, uh, it never, when a client, and I don't try to see that many clients anymore. I try to uh, find time to write and uh, explore other things. But, uh, I mean, we just always amazed at who's coming in the door and uh, and what they want to find out. And, but we can take them there. We can use hypnosis to take them back into the past, usually, and find out what caused this problem today what caused the feelings they have today and if they really have to see the future we can do that one too well richard i really truly appreciate your time and i highly suggest that people check out the large scope of your work because there is a lot of it and it is it has helped me through the years quite a bit and where can where can people find your website how do they get there uh, just go to www.dicksutphin.com. That's the website, and we've got, I think, around 400 titles up there now, and we're, uh, we've are we got about 30 or 40 here. We're going to try to get it up in the next month of some older titles, but uh, they sound, we get them remastered, and they sound, uh, they sound good, <laughs> better than they did originally. Excellent. Well, Thank Richard... You. Thank you so much for being here, sir. This is The Human Experience. My name is Xavier, and we are going to get out of here. We will see you guys next week. Thanks, Xavier. (laughs) Bye-bye.